All right, now getting onto the female side. Again, as a reminder for uh, our videos of this chapter, um, we are speaking about the typical male and female reproductive systems. Um, we are not speaking about any variations that can occur in the reproductive systems. However, if you are interested in those, I'm more than happy to talk to you about them so that you can understand the wide variety we actually do see um, from a biological standpoint. But for the sake of clarity for this video, we're going to just go off of the typical female reproductive system. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about the structures and functions of the organs we find there. We'll talk about oogenesis, and then we're going to really put a heavy emphasis on the ovarian and the menstrual cycle. So there's not as many moving parts with the female reproductive system, but uh, it kind of leans in heavier on the physio side. We're gonna briefly talk about some of those things because we have to, um, but just so that we're prepared for the stuff that is to come later. Um, and then we'll talk about how an oocyte will travel from the ovary until fertilization occurs. So let's go ahead and talk about the female and uh, reproductive anatomy, both external and internal. So let's start with the external, meaning everything we find on the outside. There's really two main parts that we find on the outside, the breasts and the vulva. Um, a lot of times you'll hear people call the vulva the vagina. Um, and if you're speaking casually, that's whatever. But keep in mind, in this class, the vulva and vagina are very different structures. Do not mix them up. You will get marked wrong if you mix them up. So the vagina is an internal structure. The vulva is the exterior. This is going to include the mon, mons pubis, the labia majora and minora, um, also called the lips, right? The clitoris and the hymen, which typically breaks for people relatively uh, quickly. Um, it does not take sex to break that. It can break from someone riding a bike. Um, on the internal side, we have the ovaries, the oviducts or the fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina. Now, like I said before, for the sake of an exam, I will use the word oviduct. However, if it is an open response question, you are welcome to use oviducts or fallopian tubes. Both are correct. So this is where we see the female reproductive side. So we see the vulva here in all of its pieces. So we see the clitoris, we see the labia minora and majora. The majora, I know it's hard to see it from here, is the more like fat pad um, type structure. And then the minora is the thinner um, lips that they can really range in terms of how much. Some people have very small labia minora. Some people have larger ones. Um, so they can really vary greatly, but they're thinner than the labia majora, right? So labia majora are more lateral, right? More towards the legs and typically are more like a fat pad, whereas the labia minora are on the inside, they're more medial and they tend to be thinner. Uh, moving up, we see the vagina here. Notice that the anus, vagina, and urethra are all completely separate. The, I mean, I would hope you know that the anus and vagina are separate, um, unless you have like a fistula, in which case please see a doctor. Uh, but the vagina and the urethra are 100% separate. They do not cross over the way that they do in the male reproductive side. All right, that's a big thing. Big thing, big thing, big thing right there. You should know that. Um, so vagina, we have the cervix, which is right here kind of at the base of our uterus. We have the fornix of the uterus. It's kind of like little, looks almost like a fish hook, right? The uterus itself, and then the ovary right here. Um, on the front here, we have the mons pubis. This is what you would think of your pubic mound, right? Uh, from the front, it's a little easier to see, right? We see the vagina. We see the cervix, this little opening. This will dilate when, um, during childbirth. Uh, we see some of the clitoral tissue, which actually kind of goes all the way around, almost like a little V or a U shape. And then the uterus the fallopian tube, which we could not see on the other view, or the oviduct, the ovary, and then there's these little finger-like projections that I'll call called fimbriae that are coming around that ovary. We also have ligaments like the broad ligament and the ovarian ligament to hold these things, kind of suspend them in place. 
So let's go ahead and talk about the external side, the vulva. Again, vulva and vagina are not the same thing. Please, please, please make sure you don't make that mistake. The vulva is everything we see on the outside, including the mons pubis, sometimes called the pubic mound. This is where you would find pubic hair, right? It's a little bit of a fat pad. Um, we see the labia majora, which again are a fattier, larger lip. This is the more lateral towards the leg. The labia minora are smaller, typically covering up the clitoris, although not always. There's a lot of variation in this structure between uh, anyone with a vagina. Um, again, when you say smaller, they tend to be thinner. For some people, they can be much smaller. Other people, they can be um, similar-ish towards the majora. The glans clitoris is the most sensitive area. Um, and so again, this is analogous to the head of the penis. And so this is also why many people, many, many people with a vagina require clitoral stimulation during sexual intercourse is because oh, there's a lot more nerves in the glans clitoris than there are compared to other parts of the female genitalia. Um, so something to, to consider, there's a biological reason, right, that uh, simple penetration is not always enough for someone because biologically, right, the clitoris has more of those nerve endings, which leads to more sensitivity, which leads to people requiring stimulation of that, that particular part. Uh, the hymen is a thin membrane that partially covers the vagina. Again, this can tear. Um, it does not have anything to do with virginity. Um, in fact, most people with a hymen will have it tear or have it, you know, change um, before they ever have sex for the first time. Something like a bike ride can be all it takes for something like that. Um, we also have the Bartholin's glands, which are going to be responsible for lubrication so that that person can um, have some sort of lubrication for sexual intercourse rather than just dry. So if we were to look at what this looks like, um, so here we see it, the exterior, right? We see like as if it was viewed in the doctor's office, whereas over here we've removed some of those tissues so we can see some of the other more hidden structures. So this would be the covering. It's kind of like the prepuce. So this is gonna be similar to the um, foreskin of a penis. The glans clitoris, which is right here, that's going to be the most sensitive part. And again, it's analogous to the head of a penis or the glans penis. It even kind of looks like it, right? Kind of almost even looks very similar. The labia minora, which again, are these smaller, thin, kind of wrinkled lips on the inside. Uh, we do have the corpus cavernosum, right? We do, there is a rectile tissue in the clitoris. So it experiences, although not as pronounced, it does experience, um, enlargement the same and, and erection the same way a penis would um, we have the labia majora which are these again the kind of thicker more fatty um, skin pads that are more towards the legs and then we see there's a urethral opening and a vaginal opening they are separate they are separate they are separate why do i keep repeating that because i see that mistake all the time um, here we see them kind of with everything removed and we see that there are these Bartholin glands, these bigger pieces here, um, that are going to produce lubricants and we see those openings so that we can lubricate the uh, vaginal canal for sexual intercourse. Getting to the vagina, now we're on the interior. This is going to be our reproductive tract. So you may see vaginal canal, vagina, reproductive tract birth canal, right? All those things, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about a vagina. This is going to come from the uterus down and exit out through the bottom. This is used for sexual intercourse. It's also going to be where menses is going to drain. So when someone has their period, it will exit through the vagina as well. And for childbirth, it will serve as the birth canal. So multi-purpose, right? With this. Um, we have an inner mucous membrane that has transverse rugae, so there actually is some um, ribbing almost, we could say, to it. It's not completely smooth. Um, there is smooth mu muscle in the middle and then on the outer edge of the vagina. So we're talking about like what would not come into contact with the, the penis, right? The inner mucous membrane is what would come into contact during sexual intercourse. 
and then the outer fibrous adventitia is like deeper in inside the body like you're not touching that if, you, if you're touching the outer fibrous adventitia then uh well you've punctured something um, the vagina also has a lot of bacteria that are normal for there so there are normal bacteria that colonize the vagina this is to maintain good health because these bacteria are, are harmless they help actually maintain the acidic environment so you need them right uh, you need these bacteria there to produce acids that protect you from harmful bacteria so they're the good bacteria just like how you have bad, good bacteria in your gut you have good bacteria in the vagina as well because think of it this way if you have uh, a street of houses and all the houses are occupied nobody can come in and like squat right and cause problems but if all the houses are vacant it's very easy for someone to come in and they can just take over that house and do whatever they want right they can become squatters so think of the good healthy bacteria as the good happy homeowners or, or, or renters who are living and maintaining the properties versus squatters coming in who just like wreck the abandoned buildings um, and this is why too if you have a vagina and you have to take antibiotics that you may find that you get uh, a yeast infection or bacterial vaginosis after taking antibiotics because your you your medication has disrupted the normal flora found in the vagina moving up to the ovaries these are these little almond sized gonads we find deeper in the pelvis and they're going to be held in place because i mean they're small and they're suspended in the abdominal cavity basically they have the mesovarium the broad ligament the suspensory ligament and the ovarian ligament all holding them in place so this is a nice drawing right where we can see everything together so here's the ligament of the ovary kind of following along that fallopian tube right right or kind of well yeah kind of sort and then it diverges the broad ligament, which I mean, it's broad, right? It's wide, so hence that name. Um, and we don't see the other ones. And so these are really the two that I would say I care about the most, right? Would be these ones. So let's go ahead and talk about the histology of the ovary. So there is a simple cuboidal epithelium covering it. We have the tunica albuginea, similar to what we saw with the testes. Um, and then we have a cortex with these stroma where follicles develop the medulla where we find the blood and lymphatic vessels and nerves remember cortex and medulla so you should already kind of have a picture in your head where these things are cortex is closer to the edges medulla is more in the middle there is a cycle that the ovaries follow and we're going to talk about the typical cycle which is a 28 day cycle there is variation in that from 21 to up to 32 days some people are even outside of that um, typically though if you are very irregular and you're, you cannot predict your cycle with any sort of um, confidence that would be a good conversation to have with a gynecologist uh, but there's two main parts to the ovarian cycle two sides um, there's oogenesis to produce the gametes and then follicu folliculogenesis to develop ovarian follicles so we're going to start with oogonia these are the germ cells that are going to divide into primary oocytes this is happening before you're born this is where things get weird so oogenesis gets real weird real quick um, so bear with me on this one it's not the meiosis that you were taught before um, so your germ cells are already at their primary oocyte stage before you're even born and then between birth and puberty the cell division you're going to stop at meiosis one that's it you're not going to go through meiosis two yet you're going to pause halfway down through once you hit puberty ovulation will occur so that one of these um, oocytes can mature for each cycle before ovulation occurs the primary oocyte will divide what we say un unevenly right so that we can form a secondary oocyte the secondary oocyte is going to hog all of the cytoplasm to itself and that the the small cell the the leftover like chromosomes we have are going to form what's called a polar body i like to think of it like a chromosomal trash can so basically what we're doing here right is we are going to create one big cell 
So each time we have to go divide, one of the daughter cells is going to hog all the components with the exception of the extra chromosomes. The other just has the extra chromosomes and then it breaks down. Now, we are paused. We are, we've gotten through meiosis one, but we haven't gone any further at this point. We're stuck in limbo. The only way we're gonna go through meiosis two is if sperm actually gets into the ovum, gets into the egg. Then we'll go through our second division. And again, the mature ovum will have all of the cytoplasm, the organelles, right, that kind of stuff. The polar body will just have the extra chromosomes. So this is why the, the ovum, right, is so big because it's, it's keeping all the cytoplasm to itself. And it's also why the sperm doesn't really need to bring much to the table besides some DNA because the ovum already has everything. So we go through meiosis two, the mature ovum has pretty much all the cytoplasm and only one set of chromosomes. It's ready for uh, fertilization. Sperm gets in, gives its DNA, so we're back up to 46. If sperm does not get in, then the ovum just breaks down after about a day. And that's it. So we don't we, we, we don't go through meiosis two, we don't we the ovum just breaks down and then we go through menses, which is menstruation, period. So this is what it looks like. This is crazy. So this is what we're seeing. We see um before birth, everything above this blue line is before birth, before you're even born. We have our oogonium, we produce our primary oocytes, we get ready for meiosis one and we stop partway through. Then puberty happens and we allow some of those oocytes to go through the rest of meiosis one. Go through meiosis one, go through a maturation process. And then if like we get to this point before sperm penetrates, right, we are stopped in meiosis two, we have produced one polar body, which is going to have the extra, um, basically the extra chromosomes. It'll just be broken down, right? Bam. But if you see how this one's a lot bigger than this one, there's, there's a reason, right? If sperm gets in, right, we go through the rest of meiosis two. Again, you see how this guy stayed big. This one is the polar body. It's going to just have the extra chromosomes and break down. Sperm gets in, fertilization occurs, right? And if this implants, then we now we're considered pregnant. However, if there's no sperm, we are stuck here and then we will break down from this phase. Now let's talk about folliculogenesis. Uh, this is going to be the process of a follicle growing and developing. And what a follicle is, is it's an ovum, so it's the egg, as well as the supporting cells around it. Um, atresia can happen where a follicle dies. This can occur any time. You have a ton of these, so they're not really concerned for the average person because you have like one to two million of these primordial or, or like immature follicles when you're born. Um, at puberty, uh, some of these follicles will become what we call primary follicles with each cycle, and then they'll from primary become secondary follicles, right, as they go through to closer to ovulation. Um, and so we just go from a thin layer of granulosa cells around the oocyte when we're primordial. As we become a primary one, the granulosa cells get a little thicker. And then once we're secondary, we have the granulosa and the theca cells forming the outer layers around the follicle. So these theca and granulosa cells are gonna make estrogen and we need this, right? The estrogen is gonna increase as the follicle gets bigger, but this estrogen is gonna also help with ovulation. We're gonna see a spike in estrogen before ovulation occurs. Um, so we go through the secondary, become a tertiary follicle. We're gonna build up some fluid in there. We're going to form what's called a zona pellucida, which comes into play when it comes to fertilization. And then only one tertiary follicle is going to actually fully develop and get to the ovulation point. The rest of them are going to go through atresia and die off. 
right? And this is why, you know, if you get pregnant, you only have, on average, like one baby, right? Sometimes you might see two, right? Very rarely do you see three. So typically we're seeing only one of them mature. So we get this burst of estrogen. This is gonna then stimulate ovulation where we release the oocyte, but the granulosa and the theca cells are gonna stay behind in the ovary. So we're just releasing the egg. So this is what this looks like, right? Here's our primordial, you know, before birth type follicles, right? Super simple, just one little layer of granulosa cells. As we become primary follicles, we see it's the cells, the granulosa cells got a little bigger with our oocyte, right? We see the formation of the zona pellucida. Secondary, we see a thicker layer of granulosa cells. And then tertiary, we see both the granulosa and the theca cells this egg then gets released, right? The follicle ruptures, the oocyte is released during ovulation, and then we're left with what's called a corpus luteum. It's the empty follicle. Now, just because it's empty doesn't mean it's doing nothing. It's actually gonna be responsible for releasing different hormones, um, some estrogen, but the main one being progesterone to maintain the uterine lining. So hormonal control, we're gonna see something similar to what we saw on the male side. So I'm just gonna gloss over this relatively quickly because we see the hypothalamus is still in charge releasing GnRH. We see that GnRH is still telling the anterior pituitary to release LH and FSH. LH is going to be responsible for hormone production, the estrogen and progesterone. FSH is gonna be responsible for developing the follicles and the oocytes. But there's more. <laughs> we got to talk about the phases of the ovarian cycle. There's two main phases, the follicular and the luteal phase. The follicular is the first half and the luteal is the second half. Um, in the first half in the follicular phase, we are stimulating the follicles. We're going to go through a maturation process from primary to secondary, tertiary, right? So oogenesis, folliculogenesis is occurring. The eggs are maturing and we're developing those granulosa and those theca cells. We're also producing estrogen and we're gonna get a spike of that estrogen to end at ovulation. So ovulation will happen at the end of the follicular phase. After ovulation, we enter into the luteal phase. The granulosa and fecal cells that are left behind in the empty follicle will form the corpus luteum. And they'll produce estrogen, but a lot of progesterone. And this is to support early pregnancy. This is to basically make sure that uterine lining is not gonna break down. Now, if we are not pregnant, right, if that egg is never fertilized, the corpus luteum will start to um, break down. It'll form the corpus albicans. It'll not make any hormones anymore. And then this is going to be where we enter into um, someone's period, right, where we're gonna shed that inner lining, right, we're, because we're not maintaining it with the estrogen progesterone we were producing with the luteal phase. So this is just the hormonal control. I'm not going to get crazy details with this. Um, the big thing is, if we're looking at how it's controlled, is um, during the follicular phase, right? So um, this is that first half. We see that the follicles are releasing estrogen or estradiol in this case, I should say, which is going to negatively impact the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus, so negative feedback. Same thing with the endometrium and the uterus. So we're going to inhibit the um, hypothalamus and anterior pituitary with this estradiol. We are going to thicken the uterine lining a little bit. We get to ovulation. Now we are promoting the, um, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary production. This huge surge we experience in luteinizing hormone is going to trigger the like increase in estrogen and it's going to we see that spike of estrogen right before we see um, ovulation. Then down here, we're in the luteal phase, progesterone is going to inhibit the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary, and it's gonna help maintain the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus. Then we get to the uterine tubes, also called the fallopian tubes or the oviducts. I'm gonna call them oviducts for you guys. We have four different sections. This is going from medial to lateral. So from closest to the um, uterus 
towards the ovary. So the isthmus is going to be right next to the uterus. We then have the ampulla that's right next to that. This is actually where fertilization occurs. And this is important. Fertilization happens in the oviduct, in the fallopian tube. It does not happen in the uterus. And so this is one thing that can go wrong is that there are occasions where the fertilized egg does not get to the uterus, it stays in the fallopian tube and implants there instead. This is called an ectopic pregnancy. It is life-threatening. The only treatment is to terminate the pregnancy. Um, so just keep that in mind that, that this is really important to know that you fertilization does occur in the oviducts. That is normal, but sometimes implantation also happens in the oviducts. That's not normal. That's bad. We go from the ampulla to the infundibulum. This is going to widen. We have more of an open end, and then we get to the fimbriae at the end, which are these little finger-like type projections. And their whole job is to basically kind of um, waft the ovum into the tube. So kind of find that ovum and just kind of gently pull it into the oviduct. We have a mucosa on the inside lining the, the oviduct that has cilia, and that's to help sweep the ovum towards the uterus and then smooth muscle to also help with that movement. So we look at the, how this is structured, what's going on again. So here is the uterus, here is the isthmus, here is the ampulla, the infundibulum, and then the fimbria are these little tiny projections here. And so as an egg is released, right, fimbria are going to help sweep it into the tube. Here's the edge of the follicle, here's the ovarian cortex and then tunica albuginea, which is going to be that outer edge. Now we get to the uterus. The uterus is a very muscular organ we use to support in the developing embryo, the developing fetus, and we have three main sections, the fundus, the body, and the cervix. And there are three layers as well. Going from the inside out, we have the endometrium in the inside. This is what's going to build up um, when preparing for a pregnancy. It's also what is considered your period, right, with menstruation. So that during menstruation, the endometrial layer actually breaks down and that's why you see blood, but you also see sometimes other little tissues mixed in with the blood. Uh, the myometrium is the muscle layer. This is gonna be used for contractions. And the perimetrium, the outer one, is gonna be the serous membrane covering the outside of the uterus. We get to the endometrium, we have two layers. The stratum basalis, think basal, right? Like the base, the bottom. This is gonna be right next to the smooth muscle. So it's gonna be, um, it's not going to be where the fetus is touching. And the stratum functionalis, think like it's the functional layer, right? This is what's gonna have that buildup of tissue, the blood, right? If someone's pregnant, it's gonna be the tissue that supports the implantation and it's going to respond to that progesterone and the estrogen from the corpus luteum to build up and maintain itself um, to support pregnancy. If someone's not pregnant, stratum functionalis is the part that breaks down in response to the lack of estrogen and progesterone, and so this is what would shed out um, during someone's period. So we get to the fun part, the menstrual cycle. I say that um, sarcastically. I think most people who have experienced the menstrual cycle are not big fans, <laughs> but we're going to talk about it anyway. So the menstrual cycle is running right alongside the ovarian cycle. We can actually see the overlap of them, um, and we may look at that in here. Um, you will in your lab, but there's three main phases. There's menstruation, which is where you're having your period. The endometrial layer is shedding. The hormone levels like for estrogen and progesterone are low, um, and so that's causing that breakdown. Um, it also is going to um, correspond with the early follicular phase in the ovarian cycle. So typically we're looking at the first few days to up, up to a week of the menstrual cycle. Um, so the first week, we'll say three to eight days roughly, depending on the person, um, is going to be menstruation. And that's going along with the first follicles just going through their early development. We then get to the proliferative phase. This is where we are continuing the follicular phase. We're starting to see an increase in estrogen. This is like right after someone's period is over. So they just, their period's just ended, right? And so they're in the proliferative phase where the endometrial layer is going to start to thicken again. 
So it's like we're basically building up and tearing down a nursery every single every single month, if you think of it that way. But estrogen levels are rising, follicles are growing, leading to even bigger increases in estrogen, right? So we're seeing that maturation process with the follicles happening alongside this. We then get to ovulation. This is about the halfway mark, about two weeks in. That's gonna be the end of the proliferative phase. And then we get to the secretory phase. The secretory phase is preparing for possible implantation, AKA pregnancy. Um, and so endometrial glands are gonna be creating secretions. We have the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle going on, releasing estrogen and progesterone to help um, kind of create that thicker or stimulate the production of that endometrial layer to even an even thicker degree. If there's no pregnancy, corpus luteum breaks down to the corpus albicans with no hormones, endometrial layer starts to shed, and at the end of this point, we start the new cycle back with day one of somebody's period. So this is the picture. I'm not going to take us through this entire thing for sake of time, but if you need to, you can pause here, and you should have this in your notes and I think in your lab as well, but this is what's going on. You can see the overlap, so keep in mind, like, these are all lined up with each other for the most part. This is the only one that maybe needs to be stretched out a little bit, but they pretty much are all lining up from day zero, day one basically, which is the first day of somebody's period to the last day of their cycle, right before they start their next period. Lastly, we get to breasts, which are a special secondary sex characteristic or accessory organ of the female reproductive system. We didn't point out any on the male side because there really aren't any that do anything in particular, but the breasts actually have a very specific job because their job is to feed a baby, right? Lactation, produce milk with the mammary glands, right? These have these alveoli, they milk, make milk. Milk is then goes into lactiferous ducts, then empty into lactiferous sinuses, and those sinuses lead to the nipples, which the baby would latch onto and use for nourishment. So this is what we would see in terms of its structure. So on the outside right here is the breast tissue. We see the, the, the areola, this, what people would probably call like the nipple, but technically the nipple is just the nub here in the center. The areola is going around it. There's a lot of variation in these in terms of shape, color, and size. Um, the areolar glands, if an areola is not super flat, right, there are little bumps and ridges and whatnot, those are the areolar glands. And if we go deeper in, right, we see the alveoli, right, these little sacs basically where we can produce things like milk. We see the lactiferous ducts running away from them towards the center, right? We see the lactiferous sinuses, the wider spots, and then those all branch up to the nipple for milk flow. So as the baby latches onto this, right, they're pulling milk from the alveoli through the lactiferous ducts through the lactiferous sinuses. 